Hi guys, it is a gloomy, stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. I believe it's the first day of spring here, uh, here on Planet Planet, as I'm calling it now. The first day of spring 2020, and this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but as you guys know by now, this week we're doing a special series called the Coronavirus Chronicles, where I'm bringing on about two dozen people from all aspects of this discussion, talking about the coronavirus effects on the economy and global industrial civilization. And my latest guest, she needs no introduction at all. Uh, she is the brains, and I do mean the brains, behind our, the excellent website, Our Finite World. I have had this woman on the show before, and we're welcoming her back again today. Gail Tverberg, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this rousing discussion. Hello there. Okay. Good to be with you. Okay, so Gail, uh, like I'm doing with all my guests, I'm just starting with the overarching question is the coronavirus the trigger that so many of us have been waiting for to trigger the beginning of the end of global industrial civilization? And why or why not? I guess I would say it's the reaction to the coronavirus that is what is causing the trigger to the beginning of the end of civilization. The reaction by the by the general public is what you're talking about more than the reaction by the uh, uh, official government agencies. Is that what you're referring well, to? Well, it's the reaction that that the this whole idea that we humans are in charge. The epidemiologists have come up with this great plan of how we can hold it back, and so they convince the politicians and. They tell the public that, yes, if we just do these things, we can, we can be in charge and we can fix the whole problem. And you're not buying it? You're, you're, not, uh, you're not agreeing that we can? No. No, there's no way that no matter what we do, we don't fix it. You know, we can just, you know, it's sort of like putting a big wet blanket over the economy and, you know, we put it on there and we just smother the economy for as long as we choose. And then we go, oops, oh, we can't take the wet blanket off. It's just too bad. That's the way it worked. And we're just going to have a permanent wet blanket on the economy from, from here on out. Uh, and the coronavirus is just one more, one more reason for that. Uh, the coronavirus will continue to circulate. Uh, what we're doing is lengthening the length of the time that the coronavirus will be with us. How are we doing that? Well, if you're damping down the percentage that have it now, you increase the number who will have it later. All of these little graphs they show you are demonstrating this fact. You know, and they don't put a little timeline on it. But, you know, it's going to be back for years. So, uh, and in fact, it probably will keep mutating. So, so uh, well, uh, up, up, and, up until the last couple of words, I, I'm a little confused. So do you consider uh, the, the main threat to global industrial civilization from coronavirus to be from the virus itself or from all of the knock-on uh, economic uh, effects that are going to play out over the next who knows how long uh, to ultimately do the most damage to uh, global industrial civilization? Well, the economy was in pretty bad shape to begin with, but it basically cannot withstand this wet blanket being put over the top of it. Yes, yeah, so... So where would you place uh, at, at, at this point, uh, with all the craziness that we've seen un unrolling, and just in the past, good Lord, just the past week, 
Where do you now place the coronavirus in the list of threats uh, against civilization? Is it is it worked its way to the top? Is it at the very bottom? Is it nowhere on the list? Or is it just one more piece of the mix that's at working together? The, the coronavirus is a piece of the mix, and the reason, you know, it's the this whole idea that we're in charge and we can fix anything, you know, that our doctors can fix things, and we have such a big global economy that somehow or other we're going to be able to find all of those uh, whatever supplies we need for sanitation and for everything else, and we can have this all go on besides everything else that we normally have go on, and there will never be a problem with it. And, you know, somehow or other, this damp down virus, we can damp it down so it even almost disappears or something, or maybe there's going to be a vaccine that magically appears. But it just doesn't happen that way. So this is, do you see coronavirus as is, is something we're going to have to figure out uh, a, a way to live with? Uh, and, and the way that they're coming up with is, is not a workable way to live with coronavirus. I think it will collapse the economy. And so whether we live with it or some remainder of the population lives with it, uh, it will be with us for a long time probably. Okay. Certainly it will be coming around for at least a couple of years, but it may come along around indefinitely just depending on how it works out just joining the place with with everything else with flu heart disease cancer uh right. car wrecks suicides it'll just be one more one more thing that can kill us right that, that that's kind of the way i'm reading it it's just one more uh, i i mean I, I don't see heart disease and cancer and Escalating suicide rates, uh, sending people to the, you, you know, sending people to Walmart buying 25 packs of toilet paper. What, no. what is it about the coronavirus that, uh, that has instilled such an absolute panic in the public? Well, I think part of it is the fact that. They're being, you know, kept in their homes, and they're being closing down stores and closing down everything else. People are losing their jobs. You know, they fear that the shelves of the stores are going to be empty, and they are. Well, yeah, it's a it, it, it's a good fear because they they made them empty. Uh, but by all the the the, the panic buying and the. And the hoarding. Well, I want to talk about. So it sounds like you're not real satisfied with the uh, rea the reaction. I want to before we get deeper into the public reaction and what that means. Uh, I, I want to talk with you. I think more about the official government reaction, which is getting more and more with each passing day, more and more draconian. I think we can all agree more authoritarian, more draconian. I guess the entire state of California is on lockdown uh, today now. You see more and more quarantines, lockdowns, businesses being uh, taken, you know, shut down. I guess Donald Trump pulled out some law out of his back pocket where the federal government can start telling businesses, private businesses, what they can and cannot do with their businesses. So uh, do you, are you reading this as an overreaction, an overreach by the, the government in its response to this level of threat? Do you think it's not enough? Or do you think the government's doing about uh, the best it can do under the circumstances? I think they've done a whole lot more than they need to. I think they should be saying, you know, well, we'll all catch this and this is the way it is, folks. So, uh, okay, you, you, I, I want you to know, Gal, you are the first person, I think you're the 22nd person I have interviewed. You are, you are the first person to... Uh, risk your social media standing uh, by, by coming out with that statement. And I congratulate you for your honesty and, and your bravery. And I hope it doesn't come back to haunt you 
too bad that uh, so so why do you why do you think it's no where, where is the government overreaching well I think it, well I think it's really goes back to the epidemiologists and these others who think that they have a whole lot more power than they do and they don't understand that we have an economy that's connected with everything else and uh, it, uh, you know when you take productive people out of the workforce you are collapsing the economy and it brings the prices of commodities way down and it drops the price of oil and right drops the price of all kinds of commodities for instance uh, the phosphate rocks that we use for fertilizer way down. So it interferes with the whole system so that the system collapses. You know, we can't have food. And so the empty, the stores empty of food. So, you know, we're doing something that's really rather, uh, you know, a, a wet blanket on our system, and it's something that is very, very harmful to the system. So, uh, uh, okay, it sounds like you're willing to uh, to go to what I call my third rail question. I, I don't have my questions in front of me, and neither do you, but, I, but, I, but I've asked them of enough people. Now, a lot of folks that I've interviewed don't even want to go where I'm getting ready to go, but it sounds like you might be willing to, so... I, I, since you since you were voicing a concern of government overreach, so my question is, do you think the the level of threat being posed by coronavirus to to humanity, uh, the the response by government that does that does government have the right to curtail? Such a, such basic freedoms that we're supposed to be enjoying, such as freedom of assembly and more and more freedom of movement. I'm hearing about even the pursuit of happiness. Or do you think it should be left to individuals to assess their own level of threat and and decide how they want to uh, respond to it? Well, basically, I don't opine on politics. Uh, what I find on is how this is likely to work out, and I think the top level of governments are likely to be overthrown in a lot of places. I think, like in China, you know, you've got the top level, and uh, you know, got President Xi, uh, you know, and all of these people at the top dictating what's going on, uh, and you get the top level disappears. And in the United States, we're at the risk of the top level of government disappearing. You know, that's just, it, it, it just can't work out. And you lose the European Union piece uh, because people become unhappy, but also because there just aren't enough resources to allow this top layer to continue. But what, what I am seeing and what others have pointed out to me, at least at this phase, is I am seeing so many people and, and, and on both sides of the political spectrum. This is not a left-right split paradigm right. that I see more and more people cheering on and demanding that the government become uh, more authoritarian and draconian in their measures. Uh, are you picking up on that? It, that seems to be the direction that, you know, what we, you've got to save us from this terrible, terrible virus kind of thing. And you're going, come on now, give us a break. You know, doesn't your Indian system do anything? Uh, you know, that, that what happens is that there's not enough energy per capita to keep the whole system going. And part of what you can't support is these top levels of government. And what I see is happening is that these governments will eventually collapse. But, but not because of a, a, a revolution of, uh, uh, of the masses. It, 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 it sounds it like could be in some cases. 
in some cases it might be revolution, you know, which seeing what happened in France, you know, when they were having all of these things, we tried to raise the tax on this and that. Uh, so you might get some revolutions, but I think it will be just as much that they have, the governments keep cutting taxes and they don't have the funds to pay Social Security and Medicare and they don't have the funds to pay all these other things. And they say, well, we'll just give these programs back to the state and we'll let them, you know, provide them to the extent they actually have the revenue to do it. And maybe it just dwindles away so that they really have much less to say about anything. Or maybe they disappear altogether when they can't pay all the debt and all of the uh, and all of this funny money becomes more and more of a problem. Well, they're certainly printing more and more of that. Uh, what, what do they call it? Helicopter money. Uh, right. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my check. I'm, I'm sure you are too. So anyway, I, I, I want to talk. Let's move, shift the conversation since we're already 16 minutes into this. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, what are you making of the re reaction of the general public? So I don't know what it's like where you are, but here in Texas, you know, it, it's looks to me like the opening uh, the opening shot for Mad Max. Uh, are you surprised by all of the hoarding and panic buying and ramping up of gun and ammo sales and all that? Or is this what you were, you've been talking about, expecting to see? Well, if, I, if somebody started dictating all these goofy things to me, I think the first thing I would think of is, you know, the, the economy is collapsing. And I need to, you know, make sure I've got enough stuff in my pantry. So it was not a big surprise. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like a contradiction. On on one on one hand, is is wow, look at this. But on the other hand, is you know, it's human nature when uh, when in panic to it, it's it's just a natural reaction to a to a panic. Do, do, do you think the panic is being overblown? And and do you blame any of that on the media? Uh, I think there's a real danger ahead. Uh, I, I, you know, not the food in the stores. What would you say is the main? The, what 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 do you see as the main danger ahead, stemming from? Well, from, the, all the broken supply lines. Uh, you know that the and the financial system essentially collapsing, and as I was saying, the top level of the government collapsing. Yeah. So, uh, so obviously, Gail. I, I mean, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you you don't think that this uh, coronavirus episode is going to be the the final bullet in the chamber. That it's uh, that there's going to be other things coming along on top of it that that are going to be far worse. There's everything all acts together and. Everybody, you know, nobody is going to really quite understand what caused what or whatever. I mean, China was in terrible condition back before the end of the year. You know, they had lost automobile sales two years in a row. You know, their people were not doing well. And that put them more in a position that they were uh, more vulnerable to the virus and such things. So there's a whole lot of things that go into this together, um, but I think that what's happening is that the low oil prices, the low gas prices, the low coal prices are going to push the economy under. And, and maybe we'll have some new kind of economy, but it doesn't have the same central governments that we've had in the past, and it has a lot fewer population because there's shortages of food and shortages of many other things. So do you think that there is a risk, I mean, speak, speaking of, uh, of, of, of literally people dying, that, that the coronavirus, the knock-on effects, the knock-on economic effects 
being triggered by coronavirus are ultimately going to be responsible for more deaths than if we had just let it ride out its course. Yeah, I think that the that the you know the wet blanket effect is going to be a great deal worse than just the coronavirus effect. The coronavirus is relatively small in the whole scheme of things. Yes, it is. So, are you of the? Uh, a lot of people are talking about uh, that the the silver lining in in this, as far as humanity is concerned, is that some sort of critical mass is going to awaken from uh, and actually learn a lesson from this, and and we are going to a new paradigm is going to arise from the ashes. Do you see a possibility of a positive outcome down the road, or do you think it's just going to be right back to business as normal once once crisis mode wears off and we're just waiting around for the next axe to fall? Well, I think there's going to be such great changes that we're not even going to be able to compare the, the you know, present to the, the new state. There will be a much smaller population uh, after all of the things settle. It, it, it just won't be the same. I think that during this time there are civil, silver linings that you know families are closer and uh, that you know you appreciate more of what you have. But in terms of this new understanding and all of this stuff, I think we're kidding ourselves. That this is. This is really coming to collapse right now. Yep. Okay, then. Always we want to finish on the the only positive angle that I've found much. Uh, if, if we were not talking about humans, but from a planetary perspective and our fellow Earthlings, is this quite the crisis to our fellow Earthlings that it is to humans? Is it the crisis to the fellow Earthlings? Well, the, the, the laws of physics operate to make the whole thing work, and, and I think it would work out perfectly well regardless. You know, it, it, it's not our responsibility to, quote, save the planet. The, the, you know, the ecosystem will save itself. And, you know, it, it, this should give everything that Greta Thunberg would ever want. You know, we'll stop all the oil, stop all the gas, stop everything, but you also stop the population. I have not heard Greta's input. Maybe I should have called Greta uh, to get her opinion. Anyway, uh, Gail Verberg, I do not know where 23 minutes of uh, my life has just gone. I feel like you just got on the phone. So stick around for just a minute after we wrap this up. But guys, I, as much as this pains me to say, I am going to have to... Uh, wrap this up and if you enjoyed what Gail had to share with us please thumb up this video and subscribe when you're over here and Gail to Verberg we really appreciate you taking this time out on your birthday happy birthday to Gail on your birthday in this busy week and we really appreciate that we'll let you get back to your birthday and more importantly keep up the good fight thank you Bye, guys.